So if you can turn there, if you're not there already, and once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing and says, verse 1, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who... 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, will you, at this time, enable us to give you our undivided attention as you speak into our lives in and through your word? Would you open our eyes so that we can see that which you desire to show us today in our ears that we would hear what you would speak to us today Lord we don't want anything to keep us away from that which you're going to do in our midst today we pray in Jesus name Amen you can be seated thank you So today's teaching is going to be part one of a new series I've titled, Why We Go Through Trials. In chapter 11, we looked at some of the ways to get through a trial. And now in chapter 12, we're going to turn a corner of sorts and look at the why of trials. Maybe better said, why it is that we even have to go through trials and what it is that God does in and through those trials in our lives. In today's text, we see our first why, and it's that trials, very simply, enable us to see what God is showing us. You might say it and see it this way. Trials get our attention, and God uses those trials to get our attention so that he can show us something and do in us that which he desires to do. Now, very interesting in verse 1, Paul says it's doubtless that anything will be gained for him to continue boasting, yet he says, I must boast. And if I must boast, I'm going to boast about visions and revelations from the Lord. In verse 2, he describes in the third person how 14 years prior he was caught up to the third heaven. And he says this twice. He doesn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body. He says only God knows that. And in verses 3 and 4, he says whether I was in the body or out of the body, I heard inexpressible words that no one is permitted to utter. Some of your translations render it that it would be unlawful (laughs) to utter. What Paul is describing here, that which took place 14 years ago, brings up a couple of questions that I think that we need to answer. I think it'll be germane to our understanding of why he even talks about this. He's never talked about this before. And yet here, and it takes him 14 years to do it. And even when he does do it, he's reluctant to do it. The first question is actually twofold. And it has to do with why does he speak about this in the third person? Uh, and, and then further, how do we know that this was him in the first place? Well, first, 
I believe that he talks about this in the third person because he's grown weary of talking about himself, even boasting about himself. Paul wants to preach Christ and him crucified. Paul doesn't, I don't see him as ever being one who wanted to waste time. He just wanted to talk about Jesus. And if he finds himself in this position with the Corinthian church where he's sort of forced to not only talk about himself but defend himself against the false accusations of these super apostles, as he calls them. As for how we know it's him that he's talking about in the third person, we'll see when we get to verse 7 where he says that he was given a thorn in the flesh. And it was to, interesting, torment him. Why? Because when he was caught up to the third heaven and had seen these inexpressible visions of heaven, heard these inexpressible words that he could get puffed up. He could become proud. So God had to give him this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. And that's why we know that this happened to Paul. Well, the second question has to do with what actually happened. And maybe more importantly, when it happened and where it happened. Bible commentators suggest that there are three possibilities, one of which is that it may have happened during Paul's 10 years in Syria and Cilicia. A second possibility is that it happened when Paul was stoned in Lystra. And the third possibility is that it happened during his time in Antioch. We really don't know, and we don't know because we can't know. But what we can know is that if God deemed it necessary, Paul would have included this detail in his account. However, uh, this hasn't stopped many a Bible teacher from speculating, present company included. Uh, I believe that it was when he was stoned in Lystra and left for dead. It is very possible that his spirit did leave his body when he was caught up to heaven. And to me, that actually explains why Paul was unsure about whether or not he was actually taken to heaven in his body or out of his body. Adam Clark said it this way, as he could not decide himself, it would be ridiculous in us to attempt it. So I guess I'm ridiculous, and so I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> this brings us to the main question that I think needs to be answered. It's not so much what happened, where it happened even, or when it happened, but how. What do I mean? Well, how did Paul receive this vision of heaven when he was caught up to heaven? Answer, you see it on the screen, came by way of a trial. Oh, how I wish that it didn't come that way. I wish it would come a different way. Uh, I think of Isaiah, who says that God has chosen the furnace of affliction to refine you. I don't want the furnace of affliction, okay? I, I, can he refine me some other way? Is, instead of the furnace of affliction, how about the beaches of Hawaii, <laughs> where I spent the last couple of weeks? I mean, um, everybody was commenting, wow, you're so tanned, to which I just say, I was born this way, okay? So it's a skin pigment thing, but anyway. <laughs> It's what James talks about with our faith being more precious than gold. And it has to be subjected to that fire, that purifying fire. Because if it's not subjected to that purifying fire, then the impurities cannot come to the surface for the goldsmith to then scrape off so that he has pure gold. 
And he knows he has pure gold when he can see his image in that gold. You making the connection here? You know the verse Romans 8, 28, we love to quote it. We've got it memorized. We sing about it. We tell people who are going through trials, know that God works all things together for the good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Well, you know what his purpose is? It's in Romans 8, 29, the next verse. His purpose is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And that's how he does it. It's through the trials. It's through the trials. And sometimes they're, they're not only trials, they're life and death trials. Especially for Paul, if it happened in Lystra, this was a life and death trial. Well, throughout scriptures, there seems to be this common denominator when it comes to visions and revelations coming this way, like this one with Paul. A difficult trial precedes the vision as a catalyst for the vision. And oh, by the way, this isn't the first time that Paul was on the receiving end of a vision while in the midst of her life or death trial. In Acts 27, they're about to be shipwrecked. They're facing this perilous storm, certainly a life and death situation. And it's at that moment that God appears to Paul and gives him a vision that nobody's going to perish. But it comes that way. The trial, the life or death trial preceded that vision for Paul. Not just here in 2 Corinthians, but also back in Acts chapter 27. Not just Paul. How about Stephen when he was martyred? Ironically enough, then Saul of Tarsus was there. He's about to be put to death. And at that moment, he is given a vision of Jesus. It's really quite powerful, actually. How about the Apostle John? Left for dead on the island of Patmos. That's where they sent you to die. This was not a tropical island that you just go and enjoy. It's barren. And you die there. And that's why they sent him there. So he's at the point of death and soon to die. And that's when the Lord appears to him. And that's where we have and why we have the book of Revelation, which, by the way, <laughs> is the only book of all 66 books of the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. No other book that is said of, that there's a blessing. And isn't it sad that it's the one book that most Christians have never read? And they don't read it because they think it's a hard book to understand. I think the enemy wins in that regard because the enemy doesn't want a Christian to read or hear or take to heart the words written in the book of Revelation. Don't get me started on the book of Revelation. I'll never stop. You're going, we didn't get you started. You got you started. Okay, I'll stop then. <laughs> well, that's the New Testament. Replete throughout the Old Testament, numerous examples of God giving visions to those in the midst of life and death trials. Joseph. I love Joseph. He's on the receiving end of a powerful and prophetic dream, while at the same time his brothers want to kill him. And that's when it comes. Jacob. Another example. He too received a vision of Jesus Christ as a ladder from heaven to earth, while at the same time his brother, Esau, wanted to kill him. The prophet Isaiah, 
in the year that King Uzziah died is so distraught that God has to give him a vision of him seated on the throne. If you don't mind, I'd like to read it. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. We're studying about the kings in Second Chronicles. And it says, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. You think that settled Isaiah? You better believe it did. He was so distraught in the year that King Uzziah died. He was a good king, one of only nine good kings in the history of the kings of Israel. Uh, interesting, when he's given this vision, he sees the Lord sitting on the throne. Could you imagine if he saw the Lord pacing back and forth in front of the throne? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> king Uzziah died. What are we going to do? I know that's kind of silly, but God is on the throne. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's almost become cliche for us. You're in the trial of your life, hanging on for dear life, and here comes a well-intentioned brother or sister in Christ, and they say to you with that smile on their face, easy for them to smile, God's still on the throne. I know. Well, my personal favorite example is Elijah. Elijah is a very interesting man. Elijah is running for his life. He has a contract out on his life. And if you can imagine, he actually wants God to take his life. He's had it. He's not only running from Ahab and Jezebel, he's running from God. And I would submit, he's angry with God. What? Yeah. Why? Because when he called fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifices on the altar and had all the prophets of Baal killed, he thought, he expected that God was going to kill Ahab and Jezebel at the same time, and he didn't. Have you ever expected God to do what you thought he should do and he didn't? Yeah, me neither. I haven't ever done that. <laughs> and, he, and he had become disappointed, disenchanted, disgruntled with God. And he, and he tries to quit. And here's the problem. Prophets and servants can't quit. God doesn't even fire you. <laughs> His gifts and callings are without repentance. So he's running from God. And it's at this very moment that the Lord comes to him. And the way the Lord reveals himself to him and speaks to him is so fascinating to me. And there's a reason he does it. Stay with me on this. First, you have the dramatic earthquake. Wind, fire, and God's not in the earthquake, the wind, the fire. And I'm convinced that Elijah and the Elijahs of this world expect God to come in the fire. I mean, he just got done calling fire down from heaven. Yet future, he doesn't know it yet. He's got a fiery chariot ride to heaven. And he's got a future revelation at the Mount of Transfiguration, yet future. And you might say that he's got a proclivity to the big, to the dramatic. I'm not suggesting he was a pyromaniac, but everything he did was associated with fire. 
And then here comes God, and he doesn't come in the fire. He doesn't speak in the fire. Instead, he speaks in the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I know this will date me, but you remember that uh, shampoo commercial from like 150 years ago? And (laughs) this lady comes on, and she goes, if you want to get somebody's attention, whisper. See, I just got your attention. (laughs) Not that I didn't have it before, but you were listening. I think of the Proverbs that says, a soft answer breaks a bone. And if you think about it, when somebody's yelling at you, and they're screaming at you, don't you kind of, when they hit a certain octave, just kind of mute them, put them on mute? I did that with my mom growing up with her thick accent. When she would get mad at me, she would yell, Wahido! And all I could hear was, and I didn't hear anything else. Because (laughs) I just, you know, I hit that mute button. And with Elijah, I'm of the belief that he needed for God to come in this way. Not in the big, but in the small. I think it was Oswald Chambers that said, you know, we expect God to come through a door. We expect God to open big doors. Well, what if he wants to come in through a small window? Well, I had never considered that. Well, maybe that's why God is doing what he's doing is so that you will. Because absent that trial that you're in, you would never possibly consider it, let alone think about it. So the Lord at that moment speaks to him, and I, and I love what he says in that still small voice. Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> he knew where he was, and he knew what he was doing there, but he asks him, what, what are you doing here? Elijah's response? Stop! Elijah's feeling sorry for himself. He's throwing a pity party for himself. By the way, do people show up at your pity parties? They don't come to mine. It's just me. (laughs) Feeling sorry for me. (laughs) And God speaks to him and basically tells him, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get up and get moving. We still got work to do. (laughs) You have no idea what I have for you. You have no idea, Elijah. Now, There's a problem here. And the problem is that we're all prone to think, okay, sure, Elijah, Isaiah, Jacob, Joseph, Paul, et al., they're all the exception. Not me, not little old me. Of course, this is going to happen for people like them, but certainly... Not someone like me. Well, the problem with that is is that nothing could be further from the truth. Here's the truth. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as such, he still reveals to us those things in and through the trials. Like with them in their day, we too in our day, are oftentimes on the receiving end of that which God wants us to see, and it usually comes packaged with a trial. I'm going to take it a step further and suggest that this may be the very reason you find yourself in the trial that you're in today, and you brought it to church with you today. And Nobody sees your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God knows your heart, and God knows your heart is hurting. Now, if that's the case, and if that's you, then here's the question. What is it that God wants you to see? Certainly, God has allowed you to go through 
this trial for a reason. What, is, what does he want to show you? What does he want to reveal to you? What does he want to speak to you? Now that he's got your attention, right? I think of I, uh, Ecclesiastes 7.14. Basically goes like this. During times of prosperity, enjoy. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but when adversity strikes, oh, how I wish it didn't say when. Oh, how I wish instead it said, if possibly by chance adversity were to somehow strike. No, when. When adversity strikes, stop and consider. Now that God's got your attention, stop and consider. God brings the one alongside the other. He allows the prosperity alongside the adversity. And here's why. It's so that you will consider. And man can know nothing about his future. Isn't it true that when adversity strikes, we're talking to the Lord? Oh, when was the last time you heard a Christian share this? Man, I tell you, God really got my attention. Oh, wow, what happened? Oh, man, he blessed me so much. And I was on the receiving end of such a magnificent blessing. And I said, okay, Lord, what are you doing in my life? I'm just asking. Anybody ever? <laughs> no, the only time we do that is when adversity strikes. You know, it's kind of like the kid that only calls the parents when he needs something. I think God kind of knows that. And so he figures, okay, the only time I can get him or her to call me is when he needs something. So I'm going to put him in a position where he needs something, so he'll call me. My mom, before she dies, she says, Well, you know, you don't call me. How come you don't call me? I want to hear you. I think sometimes our Heavenly Father wants to hear us. And the only time he does is when adversity strikes. And then he allows the adversity, and then now that he's got our attention, he can show us what we could have never otherwise seen absent that trial. Here's another question. What is it that God desires to reveal to you? What is God showing you? Now that he's got your attention, what does he want to say to you? I want to close by posing this question in this way. And think about this. Think through this with me. Could it be that God is directing you to do something that you would have never even considered doing had it not been for the trial. You know, sometimes we, we get too comfortable at point A. And God wants to get us from point A to point B. But the problem is, point B is not even on our radar because things are too good in point A. And, and, and he looks at us and he says, you know, and we've got all of our ducks in a row whatever that means. I've never known what that means, but I've used it. And he, and he looks at us and, and he says, oh, look at you. <laughs> I see you have all your ducks in a row. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what are you doing? Oh, do I have your attention now? Yes. <laughs> Why did you do that? Because. I'm trying to get you from point A to point B. And the only way I'm going to get you from point A to point B is by disrupting point A vis-a-vis -a, -vis a trial. Because I have point B for you. And oh, by the way, point B is always more better, way more better. Perhaps God has allowed this trial into your life for that reason. 
And now that he's got your attention, he wants to reveal to you what he has for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. Thank you so much for these four verses, so much packed, so full here for us. And I pray, Lord, that this would sensitize us to the Holy Spirit in that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit as you speak into our lives in and through those trials. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.